All right. Welcome to the Refuge Center. Um, I like the countdown part better. If you're joining us online, welcome as well. We're glad we all get the opportunity to come worship the Lord together. He is worthy of all of our praise. Why don't we all stand for this first song, and we'll uh, ask the Lord to bless this time. Lord, we just lift up this time of worship to you, God, and we pray in Jesus' name that you would uh, fill us with your Holy Spirit, and you would just drive out any distractions, Lord. We all come from a busy week, and all types of things, Lord, that just easily pull us away from you, Father. And help us, Lord, strengthen us in those times, especially, God, just to draw our strength from you, Lord, just to draw our faith from you, God, just to, to continue to be students of your word, Lord, that we might continually be changed each day, God, as we're drawn closer and closer to you, Lord. Now, as we worship you, Father, I pray that you would be glorified. All that happens here tonight is for you. It's because of you. And Lord, we say uh, we love you and we thank you. So have your way tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship your holy name Sun comes up It's a new day dawning It's time to sing your song
All right. Praise the Lord. Feel free to remain standing or take a seat, however you prefer. Grateful for the cooler weather. Um, man, grateful that there's not so much smoke in the air, which I think means that they've got a lot of these fires contained. So grateful for the firefighters and the law enforcement that uh, at one time we uh, probably used to run from them and dislike them, but now we love them because they protect us because hopefully most of us aren't in that sin anymore and God set us free. So now we get to see uh, the community and be, you know, uh, useful parts of the community instead of uh, looking over our shoulder all the time. That's no way to live. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to face the day it's in your presence all of our fears are washed away washed away Hosanna Hosanna you are the God who saves us worthy of all our praises section tonight. It's kind of scary. <laughs> I'm forgiven 
Cause you were forsaken I'm accepted You were condemned I'm alive and well Spirit is within me Because you died and you rose again Amazing love Amazing love How can it be That you my king would die for It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. You know, I just got a new dog, and she's five months old, and uh, she's over there, and she really has a lot of energy, and all of your sporadic clapping reminds me of my five-month-old dog. But I love you guys, because I love my dog. Cause you know just what we need 
certainly is a good, good father. All right, let's see if we can clap along with this song. There you go. See? At your name, the mountains shake and crumble. At your name, the oceans roar and tumble. At your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. At your name, creation sings your story. At your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies in this praise, in this praise. Shout your name, oh Lord. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with in this praise, in this praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. There is no one like our God, we will praise you. Praise you, there's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. No one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. No one like our God. We will sing. Lord of all the earth. We shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with in this praise, in this praise. We love to shout your name, oh Lord. Amen. All right. Lord, we do just thank you. We thank you for your name. We thank you that there's power, there's all power. The name of Jesus, Lord, we know that, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess 
at that very name. Lord, there's no other name on this earth, heaven or earth, but the name of Jesus. Lord, we lift that name up tonight. Jesus, we glorify and exalt you. And I just pray now, as Pastor Tyson shares your word, that we would just open our ears and our hearts to receive from the living word of God tonight. So we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys. Well, good evening. Uh, go ahead and take a moment to greet one another if you guys have not done that. Uh, that being said, as always, welcome to the Refuge Center. If you're visiting for the first time or listening online, we're a direct overflow of Calvary Chapel Grants Pass. And I don't know about you guys, but I was absolutely blessed by that worship. Amen. Uh, you know, I think sometimes it's easy to feel, to just fall into being familiar with scripture and worship. Um, and we're, we're reminded, you guys, that God takes it serious when we worship him. God, that God actually gathers, scripture says, that the thoughts that we have and uh, just the times we praise the Lord and thank the Lord for who he is, that the Lord actually notes those things, that the Lord takes count of those. And I know for myself that's been a, a source or a point of conviction where oftentimes I do allow my heart to get cold. Oftentimes I do allow myself to just get distant from God's word because I, I think, again, it, you know, it, after any amount of time of being in church or being raised in church or knowing the word of God, I think the easy thing to do is to kind of start deciding uh, what's applicable and what's not, you, you know, what's real and what's not. You know, I know even in Southern California, there is a, well, he's a pastor. In my eyes, he's not a pastor. A pastor who actually was thrown out of seminary because he believes that scripture is, that there's contradictions. And he actually holds a church and he has arguments and debates with atheists. And so in one sense, the word of God goes out, but in another sense, it doesn't go out because he holds to the fact that scripture is flawed. And so I, I don't know about you, but I know that if we're gonna serve a God who's capable of making mistakes, and that's no God to serve at all. Amen. We serve a God who does not make mistakes. Right. So, we, so we know his word is pure and true and without mistake. And so that being said, please turn in your Bibles to Matthew 5 as we look to close out the chapter. Matthew 5, we're going to be in verse starting in verse 33. And so the question I want, kind of want to lead with tonight, or the question that I think I believe gets presented in this study is if the Lord were to find you in everyday activity, if the Lord were to come to you in everyday activity and routine, could you say that you look like a child of God? Could you say that according to Jesus' words, and according to the law that he lays out, and according to uh, what he considers to be worthy of walking as a child of God, could you say that you have lived a life worthy of the kingdom of heaven. And so verse 33, let's go ahead and pick it up. It reads, Matthew 5. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Verse 34, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? 
Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so I don't know about you, but I rejoice tonight in the fact that we have a perfect Savior. I rejoice in the fact that we have a Savior who has gone before us, who leads the way and is able and capable of holding the law. He is able and capable of completing what He has started in us. And so if there's been failure on our part, or if there's been condemnation on our part, or if there needs to be repentance on our part, what we see is that we serve a just and loving king. Amen? So let's pray and let's just go before the Lord and see what he has. And so Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this time. God, we thank you now for your word. God, we do pray, Lord, that you would just allow it to rest in our lives. God, as we just look to explore your word and your promises to us, God, I pray, Lord, that we would just be reminded of the fact that you always go before us. God, so we love you. We ask now that you would just remove any distractions, any discouragement. God, I pray, Lord, that we would walk away with a uh, more clear picture of who you are and how you operate within Scripture. God, I pray, Lord, for those who are on the fence tonight. God, that as we've maybe... Uh, wrestled with different idols in our life, or we've maybe uh, come to a place where we're not entirely sure if we can serve you with our whole heart. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just provide grace in this moment. God, that you would provide grace. Your word says that uh, your people die for lack of knowledge. God, so may it never be said here at Calvary Chapel. God, may it never be said that we do not have proper knowledge. God, but it also may, may it never be said, God, that we don't love as you love. God, that we don't live as you called us to live. God, so we pray now for this time. We ask, Lord, that you would just be over us and all we say and do. We love you and we ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, I've titled tonight's message, The King is Coming of vows and revenge. And so what we see is we open this chapter. Uh, what we're going to see, because again, the dominant theme running throughout Matthew is that the king is coming, right? We, we see this time and time again. We see this with, with uh, just the lineage. We see this with John the Baptist. We see this uh, just with the message Jesus brings himself. And so all throughout Matthew, the concept or the idea of the king coming to restore his kingdom is laid out. And so the application of the lesson is or the question is, will our hearts be ready for the king? Will our hearts be ready to receive all that he has? In the first couple chapters, what we see is we see the lineage of Jesus. And we see that he comes from a line of broken people. He comes from a line of sinners and people with real issues. And this gives me hope and encouragement because it reminds me, that God is in the business of restoring broken lives. God is in the business of restoring broken families and situations. And what we see, first point of application as we approach Matthew, is that the king cannot be stopped. That the king won't be stopped. And so what we see is that when our heart comes to a crossroads, and we have to decide if he is worthy of worship or if it is just a parable or a myth, what we see according to Matthew is that the king will have his worship. Listen to the psalmist found in Psalms 24, verses 8 through 10. It reads, Who is this king of glory? The Lord is strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. And so we see first point of application that he is the king of glory indeed. And so the application, the lesson is your heart ready for the king. In scripture, and we won't go there for the sake of time, but we have the parable of the virgins, right? Where they were waiting for their husband and some of them were not found to be uh, as ready as they could have been, right? They had to leave to go take care of things. And I think that's a good picture that many times if we're not careful, that in the midst or the business of life, we forget to check in with our king. We forget to check in with what he's doing and we seek to live our own lives and our own kingdoms. And, you know, while we want to make sure that 
we understand that there's grace, let it also be said that we look to hold to the law, that we look to hold to Scripture, that we look to hold to all that God has because what we see and what we're going to see is that the law serves its place, right? The law serves its place in our life. If it weren't for the law, we would, know, we would not know we are sinners. We would not know how badly and how often we miss the mark. And so there's encouragement in these things because of the fact that Jesus abolished and fulfilled the law, right? He didn't look to do away with. He came to complete. He didn't look to throw it away. He came to restore and to fix the broken definitions. And so what we see throughout the book of Matthew and throughout uh, the gospel and scriptures is that we come to church, we find ourselves in these moments where they're very painful and they're very confusing and you're not sure which way you want to go. And then by the grace of God, it is my prayer that we find the ability to release and trust God. And in this, we find a sweetness and a satisfaction that only comes when we give our lives to the Savior, right? Because it has been said, and I'll say it again, that he is either king of all or he is king of nothing at all. Right? And so he is either king of over all our life or he is not king within our life at all. Now, obviously, we know that there's moments of sanctification, there's moments of growing in the body, but a true mark of a child of God, a true mark of a Christian, is that they are always moving forward, even if you have to crawl. Right? And so what we see is that scripture reminds us and tells us that God is not looking down on those who are crawling for the kingdom, where if that is all you are able to do, if that is all you are able to give, we know that God loves us the same. Now, we do know that God wants to grow us in these things, that he doesn't want to leave us as we are, but what we see is that the king has laid out his agenda. As we move into chapters 2 and 3 and 4, what we see, we see the anger and the rage of King Herod. We see a man who wanted to be king over his own life, right? Scripture says that all of Jerusalem wept with him. Why? Because they all knew what it meant for his kingmanship to be challenged. We won't go there for the sake of time, but what we see is we see the wise men, they come to King Herod and they say, where's the king? Where's the king that's worthy of worship? We know that you're just a pawn. Where is the king that has been prophesied about? And so we see in scripture that Jerusalem weeps because of the fact that this man was so devoted and so driven to live for his own agenda that he puts all the newborn boys to death because he would not have another king. And I think of this in our own lives. How often do we just refuse and we just just turn the volume up to we, where we can no longer hear the Holy Spirit. Because if I listen to the Holy Spirit, that means that I have to live, I have to answer for the life I'm now living. And so rather than trusting the Lord and rather than leaning into his voice, what we do is we find ways to live for our own kingdom. We become little mini Herods where we destroy what God is seeking to do in our life. We destroy what God is wanting to do in growing us. We see, third, that the king will give his glory to no other. We see that Joseph, his father, is warned by dreams and warned uh, by God. And so he goes another way. And so what we see is that the Lord, uh, that his agenda will never be stopped, that the gospel will always go on. And, and, and so this is a lesson and this is an application that just because you and I do not worship does not make it any less true. Just because we do not hold to Scripture does not mean that he will not have his glory. Just because we decide that we will be King Herod in King Herod's in our life, we, we see that we, we hold on to our own goals and dreams. God will still be worshipped. And so Psalms 29.5, I love this verse. It reads, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. We know that his voice creates life and that his voice 
brings judgment. In chapters 3 and 4, we have the, the, his agenda will not be stopped. We have John the Baptist laying out his life for the gospel. We have in chapter 4 the temptation of Jesus. And we see that because of the fact that he, he held to a perfect life. right? Because here's the lesson. That because Jesus lived a perfect life, you and I find grace in moments of failure. That because Jesus endured, not only through the crucifixion, but through even temptation, right? Hebrews talks about this. Hebrews 4, 15 tells us, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who, one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so we see that because Jesus has lived a perfect life, we find grace. And so we rejoice this evening. I don't know what your life looks like. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what mistakes were made. I don't know what mistakes were made today. I don't know what mistakes were made this week. Maybe you broke a promise to the Lord. Maybe you broke your sobriety. Maybe you went back on a vow that you never thought that you would go back on. And in these things, we find there's not judgment. There's not condemnation. No, there's grace because of the fact that Jesus has paved the way. He goes on in Matthew 5, blessed are in the first 12 verses. Again, the word here is Mariakos. It means supremely blessed or holding an inward joy that is not connected to outside sources. And so it is an inward joy, it is an inward satisfaction, and an inward strength and passion because we do not give our souls over to the world. This is why scripture says that Jesus, though he was suspicious of no man, it says that he gave himself to no man, right? He allowed no man to hold too much control over his spirit Right? Obviously within, in connection or in contrast to the crucifixion. But the, we see in the Gospels that he wasn't worried about the fear of man. He wasn't worried about the opinion of man. Why? Scripture says he knew what was in man. And so in verses 13 through 16, we have the command that you are the light of the world. And I love this because this is, he doesn't even say when you decide or if you ever get to or if you ever grow enough. He simply says, you are the light of the world. And so the word there or the idea is to radiate, radiate the brilliancy of Christ. And so uh, I find this in my life. I find sources of conviction where I realize that I am not holding on to who Christ is in my life. I'm not holding on to the brilliancy of the gospel. And we're reminded of the words of Paul in Romans 1, verse 16, which reads, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so I ask you, are you ashamed of the gospel this evening? Are you ashamed of the words of Christ? Because scripture tells us very clearly that those who deny the Lord in front of man will be denied in front of the Father. And again, I, you know, I don't think that this is something we don't need to blast our music super loud and put stickers on everything. I mean, you, you, you completely can't. But I think sometimes the loudest life is just the faithful, the faithful one, the one that's in and out of church, the one that's in and out of their word, the one that, you know, what do your neighbors see when they look in? Because I would imagine that some of our neighbors look in and see craziness. Some of our neighbors look in and see that we look nothing like Christians, we look more like the world, right? And this is, I've been guilty of more than, of this of more than one occasion, more than one time where, you know, maybe I get frustrated or I get in an argument with the wife and next thing we know we're arguing in the Safeway parking lot, right? Where it's like, hey, you don't look like a child of God. You look like the world right now. And the world does not need more darkness. The world needs more of the light. So we see that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. And I love this because it, here it is. If you want to know what is required of salvation, Jesus lays it out in Matthew 5, verse 20. He says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so here we have these teachers and these men who held to 613 laws, and Jesus is saying, you better do better than they do. And so what we see, it is an impossible task. 
and tell, and unless, save our Savior. What we see is that Jesus is not coming to do away with the Old Testament, but he is coming rather to set it straight. At this point, what we see is that, you know, and again, we've covered this in past weeks, is that they were loosely, they were taking the law and they were hijacking it for their own personal gain. They were taking the words of God and they were hijacking it. Jesus actually says, hey, you've taken the commandments of man and the degrees of God and you've switched them out. And so what we see, uh, and this is relevant because we do this in our own lives. We do this with scripture where we take Jesus' words and we twist it to fit our agenda. We twist it to fit our decision making, right? That's why context matters so much. We need to know what was Jesus saying as a whole. And so what we see as we now come to this section, we see that they justified fits of anger. They justified attacking your neighbor as long as it didn't lead to murder. They had justified dealing harshly with their wives. They had justified living in a very loose and pleasurable manner where they were allowed to, you know, the world goes downstream because it's easy to get drunk. It doesn't take courage to get drunk. It doesn't take courage to smoke rocks. Like, I'm sorry, but it doesn't. It doesn't take courage to do these things. It takes courage to stay sober when you hurt. It takes courage to love your family when nothing's working. It takes courage to love your wife when you, you guys are on different pages. It takes courage to love your children when they're saying foolish things to you. It takes courage when they're saying things that make no sense. It's like, hey, it's past your bedtime. Right? But what we see is Jesus, he's not so quick to let us off the hook. What we see here is we approach vows and we'll try to get through it quickly. But when we go to the Old Testament, what we see is that there was an appropriate time for vows. There was an appropriate time to make a vow before God. But according to the Old Testament, what we see, it was to be done very seldomly and it was to be paid in full. Right? Deuteronomy 23, verse 21. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall, you shall not delay fulfilling it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. If a man vows a vow to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. And so what we see, point of application, you guys, Truthfulness is hard because we live in a world of white lies. Truthfulness is hard because we live in a world of white lies. And, and we think about just a couple examples. We think of taxes, how we try to maybe get around taxes or maybe relational troubles where sometimes it's just easier to tell a person, to, to tell a person you're busy rather than just saying straight out, hey, you're crazy. You don't have that passage right, and I don't have time to deal with this or the patience right now. Right? We find little ways to just say, hey, I got to take care of this. I'll catch you later. Right? Or we find little ways to cheat on our taxes. We find little ways to avoid stress by simply telling a half truth. And so what we see is that Jesus is correcting this. He say, don't give white lies. Don't give half truths. Just let your yes be yes and let your no be no. And, and so what we see is because, again, they were taking the oaths and they made it into something crazy where they, they made it as long as, and these are just some examples, you could swear by the temple, but once you swore by the gold in the temple, you are now obligated. You, you, you could swear towards, or you could swear by Jerusalem, or the moment, but the moment you swore facing Jerusalem, you'd have to pay it, right? And so this idea that as long as God did not come into your vows, you didn't have to keep it, right? And so you could divorce your wife because you never said, I swear by God. You could leave a stressful situation rather than enduring because you could say, I never swore by God, right? And so they were taking these things, and then they were taking them out of context, and Jesus is saying, no, let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. So what are some ways that we can grow in this? Well, first and foremost, 
I would say we hold to truthfulness, even when it hurts, right? This is an area even today I stumbled in. I was, I was on my way to grab a drink at the store and I ran into my old wrestling coach and because of the fact that he often gets a lot of people trying to talk to him, I didn't want to hold him up because it's been a while since we've seen each other. I could tell he kind of like, oh wait, and he, had to, he went to put his stuff down. I threw the white light, not even meaning to. I said, hey, I'll see you soon. No, I won't. No, I won't see you soon, Andrew. Right? Or, or, or rather because I didn't want to burden him or I didn't want to take the time to engage in conversation. I just said, see you soon. And I kept going, no, let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Proverbs 19.9, a false witness will not go unpunished. And he who breathes out lies will perish. Listen are the words found in Revelation 21. This is a little harsh, or it's a little more intense, so to speak, but it reads, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. All liars. That, that is very intentional language. And so what we see is that when we break our promises or we don't hold to our yes being yes or no being no, what we see is it actually comes from the evil one. And so just a couple points of application. How do we learn to guard ourselves? One, hold to truthfulness. Sometimes it may be a little painful. Sometimes it may be a little hard. But I promise God will give you wisdom in the moment if you make a commitment to live for him. Secondly, be slow to speak. Proverbs has a lot to say about this, right? Be slow to answer, be slow to speak. One author goes on to say, God wants us to be as reliable in our speech as he is. God wants us to be as reliable in our speech as he himself is. And that, that, that's crazy. Because what we see is that Jesus, man, he's holding to a much stricter version than we would may, we maybe hold to. But what we see is that God's version of grace looks much different than our version of grace. God's version of grace looks much different than our version of grace. Well, what do I mean by that? Let's pick it up. Matthew 5.38. What we see is that there is grace to be found, right? But oftentimes, just like the Pharisees, we would attempt to justify our sin. We would attempt to justify our white lies or maybe, uh, you know, not holding to the truth. Maybe we've made promises and we don't think it's that big of a deal to break him. Right? Well, no, what, what Scripture is telling us, what God's telling us, is that God wants us to be a reliable witness. God wants us to be a reliable individual that when we say something, people can know that, that that's what it's going to be. Right? Because, again, the problem here is that the oath binding, the, the, the oath that they were given, they, they got so loose with these oaths that people are now having to say, I swear to God. I'm good for it this time. I swear by all that is holy. And so what we see is that the fact that we have to swear by something greater shows the inconsistency in our spirit. It shows that because we are not faithful, that's why, right? And we don't we 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 have time, we don't it. God swears by himself. That's why Hebrews tells us that God swears by himself. Because there's no one more reliable than himself. And so to hold or uphold just, uh, you know, because uh, again, when humans swear by something, it's to get what we want or it's to kind of uh, hedge in on that point, right? When God swears, it is simply his way of reminding us that there is no greater name under heaven, That's right. that there is no greater name to be worshiped. And this is important because what we see, because think of all the people who made vows in scripture. You have Abram, Isaac, you have Jacob, David, you have Saul, you have Peter. Think of Peter denying his vows that he made, right? Claiming that he never knew this man, swearing he never knew this man. And so what we see is that God takes honesty serious. God takes a spirit with integrity serious. 
And I'm bringing this up because many times I don't. Many times I fall back in the grace of God. I say, hey, we're all saved. It's all good. Don't worry about it. It's not the end of the world. You know, we're not, you know, early on. I know my wife and I, we'd sometimes disagree a little bit over some of the youth that were more wild. You know, and she'd say, hey, you need to point them back to Christ. And that was something the Lord had to bring out and show me. Because oftentimes, you know, me, it's like, hey, if he's not robbing someone or like setting someone on fire, like, that's good enough for me, right? Like, just let him be, just let him watch his movies. You know, but no, what we see is that God's version of grace looks much different than our version and definition. Let's pick it up and get ready to close out in a few minutes. Matthew 5, 38 reads, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And so what we see, there's a couple points as we get ready to kind of tie this together. There's a couple points as Jesus moves from being truthful in your spirit and speech to now not retaliating or, or exchanging blow for blow. There's a couple things that need to be laid out. First, Jesus is not turning a blind eye to evil. Jesus is not pretending that evil doesn't exist. How do I know that? He says, your enemies. He doesn't, he doesn't say if. He doesn't say perhaps. He says, when you come across this situation. And so what we see is Jesus is not turning a blind eye to evil. And this is important to note because a lot of people have made Jesus out to this hippie made him out to be this hippie who meant well, but didn't have a proper grasp. No, he is acknowledging evil. He is acknowledging that we live in a broken world. He is acknowledging that we live in an evil world. But what we see, secondly, he is also not condoning revenge. He, he, he's not justifying that heavy gas foot. He's not justifying you giving someone a piece of your mind at the supermarket, right? And I, and I hold it because how often do we, I mean, serious, how often do we take the major scriptures that have to do with salvation and we apply it, but then when it comes to the things like patience, when it comes to the things uh, like, you know, enduring suffering, we say, not a chance. The Lord will grow me on that in time. We just say, forget it, right? No, but Jesus, no, he's not condoning revenge. He is not condoning the right to stand up for yourself. Now, we do see on the flip side, he is also not commanding us to endure abuse, right? Because, uh, again, there's so many different, if you are in a situation where you are being physically or verbally abused, you need to leave, immediately and know that does not apply to the first phasers who claim they're being abused by their overseers, right? Digging a hole is not abuse. And a little discipline. No, but if you have, for the women out there, maybe uh, just, I mean, it, it can lead to males too, but dominantly the women, if you are in a situation where you are being physically, verbally, emotionally, or psychologically abused, leave immediately. Now, whether God restores that marriage is between you and them and the Lord. But Jesus is not commanding us to endure abuse. He's not. But there is the thread to be pulled that if we can endure for righteousness sake, who are we to decide whether salvation is for someone or not? And I said this because how often do we leave situations so easy? How often do we leave just because we don't want to endure. We don't want to deal with it. It's like, ah, and you just blow it off. No, no, no. You're at your flesh and your anger, it's not justified before the Lord. That, 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 that self-righteousness who, who, who demands that you owe nothing to anyone, that's not the words of Christ. That's not the teachings of Christ. And so what we see here, uh, you know, because I, I, I bring this out because what we see here is when Jesus, and this is, it is important to know, when Jesus is referring to the slap on the right cheek, that's a backhand. That's an insult. That's what he's referring to. 
Hey, in those days, there would be something of an insult where you'd give a little backhand when you were, you know, when you and someone were really getting in it and you went to insult them. It wasn't meant to cause harm or break any bones. It was not done hard enough to cause any damage. It was more a personal assault on your character. It was an insult. And so what Jesus is saying is that when someone maligns your character, when someone insults you to the point where you are enduring verbally, verbal abuse, turn the other cheek. And so we get to hold these things in balance, right? Because so often we go to extremes where on one side what we have is we have liberal theology that says all is forgiven and all sin is okay because we serve a, a, a God of love. And that's not correct. But on the other side of it, we have people who are adding to the words of Jesus and they were, they were giving commandments that are not there. Right? They're making up rules that are not there. And so the, the question comes, who then is your neighbor? Who then is your neighbor? Because again, Jesus here, we got to remember that if there's ever a time for Jesus to stand up for his country, let me encourage you, Jesus was less of a patriot than we make him out to be. And that's going to offend some of the Americans here. But Jesus was not concerned with the colors of his flag. Jesus was concerned with his own kingdom. Jesus was concerned with the kingdom of God. And I bring this up because how often do we say they'll never take our church? We'll meet them with guns. We'll meet them with soldiers. They'll never take us. They'll never take my freedom. They'll never take my rights. You sure? Have you, have you, have you studied scripture? Because Jesus would say, blessed are you when they do take your rights and they do take your property and they do take your homes and you worship. You worship because you are not holding to all the things of this world. You are holding to the kingdom of heaven. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who'd actually, some of you don't know about him. He was actually a pastor who actively fought against Nazis. He actively looked and fought against their kingdom and looked for ways to, to fight back. He goes on to say, when a Christian meets with injustice, he no longer clings to his rights and defends them at all costs. Rather, he is absolutely free from possessions and bound to Christ alone. One author goes on to say, Jesus seems to have prayed for his tormentors even while the spikes were being driven through his hands and feet. Indeed, the language studies suggest he kept praying even through the abuse. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He goes on to say, and I love this, if the cruel torture of crucifixion could not silence our Lord's prayer for his enemies, what pain, pride, prejudice, or sloth could justify the silencing of ours? Blessed are you when you are mocked and reviled for the kingdom and you turn the other cheek. Blessed are you when you endure. Yeah, obviously use common sense. If you've made a vow, do your best to fulfill it. If you've made a promise to God, do your best to keep it. If you're in an abu abusive situation, get out of there immediately. If you're with someone who's uh, you know, manipulating you or always talking down on you, get counsel, get help, right? God doesn't call us to not use our mind. But what we see is that while we do all we can to protect the rights of others, as much as we can, we give our own rights back to the Father. We do all we can to protect those around us, but as much as we can, we give our rights back to the Lord, right? And you, you know, obviously use wisdom. You know, if you're a family man, your family comes first. You know, if you have a daughter, you are called to protect that daughter. Uh, I'm not talking about not using wisdom, but so often we look to justify, you know, and even in Luke, right? And we won't go there, but the, the Lord, he stands up and he says, hey, who's my neighbor? Right? Jesus says, love your neighbor. He says, well, who, well, who's my neighbor? Right? Because again, if there's ever a time 
For Jesus, there, there was zealots rising up who wanted to take over. There were people rising up who wanted to take over for the Jews. If there was ever a time for national pride and to fight for your rights, it could have been at that time when Jesus brought just all the volume to all the zealots. But, you know, he says, blessed are you when you suffer for the kingdom. He goes on to say in Luke 10, he, he gives the parable, right, of a man traveling who gets Wound, robbed and wounded. And he says, well, this man laying in the street, he was first passed by the priest. Then he was passed by the Levite. Rather, it was the Samaritan who helped him out, right? And I think this is interesting because the Samaritan, he had nothing to offer anyone. No one wanted anything from the Samaritan. The Samaritans, they were half-breeds. They were looked down upon. They didn't worship with the rest of the Jews. They worshiped in their own way at their own spot. And it's a picture of the gospel because Jesus saves the man who can do nothing for himself. And in closing, you and I are that wounded man. We are that man who has fallen by the wayside. And notice, we see that this wounded man could offer no return of payment to the Samaritan. We see that this Samaritan was hated by his own people. We see that the Samaritan paid the price when no one else would. So Philippians 2, 5 through 8 tells us, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Isaiah 53, 7, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that goes before it shares is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Isaiah 56, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. And so what we see is that Jesus was always a servant. Jesus was always focused on living life before his Father. And I would say tonight that many of us have not lived like that. That if the Lord were to find us tonight, we have not modeled our lives like children of God. We have not modeled our lives as children of the kingdom. But what we see, God is a loving father who is always willing to forgive. Jonah chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what I vowed I will pay for salvation belongs to the Lord. I love that that chapter and the verses before, he talks about being swallowed up by the waves of life. He talks about being ensnared in the prisons of the ocean. And maybe you this evening because you have not counted the cost. You found yourself where you're drowning in an ocean of your own prison. Or maybe even you've attempted to live a righteous life, but you've just had evil come your way. Well, what we see is that Jesus will visit. Jesus will require an answer for the just and the unjust. God is aware of all that happens in our life. And so we take heart as we close. Know that you are loved by your Savior, that he is within reach this evening. Scripture says that God is not so high that we cannot reach him. It was through the life and death of Jesus Christ. And so if you don't know what that looks like, I ask that you'd find myself or one of the overseers here. Maybe talk to Jacob Stedman. He'll give you a whole story of why you want to follow God. Because it's always easier when we choose to live as children of God. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this time. God, I do pray, Lord, that you would just allow us, God, as that was just more than less. God, I do pray, Lord, that we would just um, receive what you want us to receive. God, I pray for anyone here who doesn't know you. God, we confess our need of a Savior. Anyone who here has fallen away, God, we just confess our shortcomings. 
We ask that you'd come into our lives and teach us how to live. God, we ask, Lord, that you would just show us the way. God, wash us with your word. Forgive us by your grace and teach us how to live a life of faith. God, we love you. We thank you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, you guys, you are dismissed. Stick around and get prayer if you guys need it. God bless.